Good morning. The Lord be with you. Welcome here to our in-person worship here in the sanctuary this morning. And also I welcome all of those who are watching us online. We're welcome. Uh, we're glad that you're with us and we welcome you to this special service. Um, I want to thank our worship leaders as I do every Sunday, but we can't thank them enough because their participation and their dedication means so much to uh, the enjoyment and the praise that we offer the Lord. Jackie Hales is our music director and organist, accompanist. Uh, Kim Moran and Janet Wiley are singing today. Chris Rollins is the liturgist. And so, I, and I oh, can't forget in the back, I need to get a camera on you guys back there. Okay. <laughs> Uh, M.G. Moran and Jim March are manning the station back in the back. Today is World Communion Sunday, and that's why you see some strange things scattered around the sanctuary. You may have noticed when you came in that there was a runner on the table. That runner was from Guatemala, and the basket, John and I don't know where it came from. We just know that we've had it for a long time probably from uh, Native American origin. And then there was a little globe. I hope you noticed the globe. Um, one of my dogs barks at that globe every time he sees it. I have to put it way up on the top shelf or he'll bark at it. Um, but it has different children holding the globe up around the edges. I also wanted to point out some things in here. On the communion table are more runners from Guatemala and from Mexico. The bread plate, which you can't see underneath the napkin, but it is a replica from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The chalice, the big uh, different looking chalice, was one I purchased in Slovakia when I went with a group from Columbia Seminary uh, to that part of the world. And the bread cover, the blue cover with the fish on it, is from the Philippines. The ladle that's in front of the Bible is from Korea, and there are two little figurines. I don't know if you can see them or not, but those are called storytellers, and they are Native American origin, and they have the children gathered around the main storyteller, and it's a depiction of Jesus and the children and him telling them the stories of the Bible. Over on this side, we have um, two corn husk angels that are sitting up on the baptismal font. Both of those are from Honduras, a gift from my son. And the wreath that's propped up is made from the little dolls that we brought back from Guatemala. And my stole this morning is from Peru. So I've tried to incorporate all of these different countries uh, that we talk about and hear about, but as we have World Communion Sunday, it's always special to me to think about people all over the world having communion on this day at the same time and worshiping God in the same way. So this is very, a uh, very important day for me. Um, for those of you who are at home, I'll remind you to prepare the elements that you will use um, as we share the Lord's Supper. You may use uh, bread and grape juice if you have it. You can use crackers and water or crackers and juice. Whatever you have will be fine. And as always, on the first Sunday of the month, as we are fed at the table, we try to feed the people in our community. So we have a food collection for sharing and caring. There is a basket a grocery cart out in the narthex for you to place your food. After the service today, we will have a time of fellowship, and I remind you to distance again. Um, also, today is the last chance to buy uh, FPC shirts. We have uh, different sizes. They can tell you out there. Uh, we have some mediums and some larges uh, that are available. Um, this morning, M.G. Moran started his Sunday school Bible study again in room two of the CE building, and they are studying a comparison between Daniel and Revelation. 
So if you weren't able to get here by 8.45 this morning, I hope that you will make an extra effort to join them next Sunday. On Tuesday at 1 o'clock, the group will join on Zoom for the uh, prayers that they lift up for our congregation, for our members that, have, we, that we know of that are in need of prayer, and also for friends and the community around us. So if you would like to participate, you can get in touch with Chris through the office. Uh, if you call Pam in the office, she can give you the link to join that. And then on Wednesday at 1230, Reverend Jim Rollins is um, leading a Bible study called What, I'm sorry, Why Doesn't God Do Something? So it's a very provocative title, and I'm sure that the discussion is going to be very meaningful on that. Next Sunday, October the 10th, is another chance for liturgists to be trained. Those of you who would like to uh, serve as Chris is this morning, please call the church office to sign up so that we'll make sure that we have enough material for everyone. And by the way, there are uh, lists outside on the table in the narthex for you to sign up to serve as a liturgist. If you have been trained, please sign up for the next few weeks um, so that I will know in advance who to send the information to. Next Sunday is a busy Sunday as today is. Our stewardship emphasis begins next Sunday and most pastors will tell you that stewardship goes on all year long. We're always in the stewardship season but the emphasis will start next Sunday and it's based on 1 Peter 4.10, which says, Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gifts each of you has received. And we're going to unpack that verse, so to speak, and take each of those pieces and find out what that means to us as we strive to be good stewards of God's blessings. The offering plates are in the back of the sanctuary and online giving is encouraged. It's available on the website for your convenience. And you may always, always drop the um, offering envelopes by the church office. And Pam will take care of those. And last but not least, I would remind our elders that we have a called session meeting after the service. And we will meet here in the sanctuary. Whew. I'm tired already, aren't you? But you can't go to sleep yet. Let's, um, let's clear our minds of all that extraneous material. We can always go back and look for it on the website. But let's turn our hearts and our thoughts to the Lord our God. Let us pray together. As we gather in this place to worship and praise you, O Lord, may we be aware that your grace extends throughout the world to all people who come to you and declare that you are the Savior and the Lord of their lives. In those places where your name is not known or accepted, we pray that during this time together, you would touch our hearts so that we might share this great good news of salvation with our brothers and sisters around the globe. Help us show forth your love and compassion by the things we say, the things we do, and the faithful servants we are, named and claimed in your Holy Spirit, through the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able, and let us be called to worship as one by the words of Psalm 8, seen on the screen. O oh Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your hands, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? 
mortals, that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please remain standing as we sing to the glory of God for the beauty of the earth. seated. In God, we find light for our darkness, and through that light, we discover the things that separate us from God. And so we ask God to prove us and try us and to test our hearts and our minds that we may receive forgiveness. Let us join in the prayer of confession together, followed by a personal time of silent meditation. Let us pray. Loving God, you created us to live in relationship with you, to love and serve one another, and to care for all your creation. Yet, in the hardness of our hearts, we dismiss your commandments and seek to go our separate ways. Lord, have mercy on us. Redeem, restore, and recreate us for the sake of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. 
Who is in a position to con condemn? Only Christ. And Christ lived and died for us. Christ rose and reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. of Hebrews celebrates the Christian confession that the exalted Jesus is truly the Son of God who experienced all things just as human beings do in order that we might be counted as brothers and sisters of the risen Christ. Listen now for these words of assurance of God's love for us from Hebrews 1. And the subtitle is God has spoken by his Son. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not see everything in subjection to them. But we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he may taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Absolutely. Amen. You got me all choked up. <laughs> Sorry, trying to be healthy. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Job. We will read the first chapter, the first verse, and then move to the second chapter. Listen now for God's word to us. There once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, Skin for skin, all that people have, they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And now, O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. You don't hear too many sermons on Job. Some preachers don't like to preach on Job. I saw a, a thread of chats going back and forth on Facebook this week between different pastors and saying, okay, who's going to have the courage to preach on Job this week? There are just too many uncomfortable scenes too many unanswered and, frankly, quite troubling questions that are raised in this story. Job was apparently a good man, loving God and neighbor. And then the unexplained, horrific loss of his property. Oxen, donkeys, sheep, camels, the loss of material wealth the homes of his family, all of his servants, and his sons and daughters, everything. It's hard to imagine how a person could survive all of that. Here's what Job did, and I'm moving back to the first chapter, 
a verse, a couple of verses that we did not read. In that first episode that Satan had inflicted upon Job, it tells us, Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. So that was the first episode. And then on top of everything else, all the material and family loss, Job was subjected to deep physical attack. And the description makes me shudder. Sores from head to toe, open, weeping sores, causing great discomfort and pain. It also caused Job to separate himself from the community and place himself in the role of an outcast. So there we meet Job, sitting outside the city gates in a pile of ashes, literally down in the dumps, the trash that is hauled outside the city waiting to rot away, the garbage dump where the worst dregs are set afire in a slow, intentional, smoldering, smoky haze. There he sits, in such misery that he reaches down and grabs a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself, to relieve the itching from this disease, the festering welts, or to scrape away the foul smell of sickness and death. It must have been an awful ailment. Can you imagine being in such pain as Job? Desperate to the point of sinking down on a pile of garbage for a place of relief. The mental anguish must have been great as well. Abandoned, alone. Even his wife had no sympathy or comfort to offer. He must have been a truly pathetic, disgusting sight for her to suggest that he curse God and die. And here is where the label of patience may have been attributed to Job as he declares that he is ready to receive the bad along with the good. And as I read the rest of the story of Job and how his so-called friends accuse and blame him for his own misfortunes and how he himself shakes his fist at God and asks why, I'm not sure how patient he really was. It is a heart-wrenching story. It drags up the ageless question of why do bad things happen to good people? And to point to Jim's study on Wednesday, why doesn't God do something? And sadly, in our limited capacity of human understanding, there does not seem to be a clear, satisfactory answer. So why in the world are we talking about Job on a Sunday of celebration like this World Communion Sunday? What can we learn from this ancient story for our lives and for our world today? I think, I think it is that Job did not give up. He did not curse God at least not with his lips, not out loud. He did not stand up and publicly denounce his commitment to his Lord. And even as he sat for days in the middle of the garbage dump, Job never completely gave up on his faith and his hope. Job is an example of the human condition all around the world. We all have our garbage. We all carry the stench 
of sin. Some of it is of our own making, our own human flaws that cause us to try to fill God's place with our own efforts. Other things happen as they did to Job, for which we do not have any explanations. Whether people find themselves in the garbage dump of oppression in Central America or Africa, the garbage dump of bombing and indiscriminate killing in Afghanistan, the garbage dump of ecological challenge in the panhandle of Florida, the garbage dump of so many American cities where young people are gunned down in senseless gang wars, the garbage dump of physical or emotional pain or loneliness in our own backyard. Job reminds us that we do not sit alone. Job reminds us that it is not what we say or do that makes the difference, but about the faithfulness of God for whom and through whom all things exist and who continues to bring his beloved children to glory even through every circumstance, every trial, every challenge. The author of Hebrews uses glorious language borrowed from the Psalms, Psalm 8 in particular, to declare that God is mindful of us, meaning God cares about us. God crowns us with glory and honor. Sometimes it's hard to see all that from our situation down in the dumps. We do not see yet, at least not completely, but we can see Jesus. We can see Jesus as revealed through the words of Holy Scripture, and that's all we need. By the grace of God, Christ Jesus was made the pioneer of our salvation, the one who opened the way, blazed the trail, and leads us out of desperation of sin and human hopelessness. The one who emerged from the garbage dump in the victory of resurrection over death once and for all. In this one act of solidarity with all humanity, and I mean all humanity, the people back then in Jesus' time, the people in our time, not only was Jesus crowned with glory and honor, but we who are called and claimed as brothers and sisters in Christ are sanctified in and through him. Jesus was not ashamed to come down into the messiness of life, human life. He was not afraid of getting his hands dirty, but reached out to the lowly, the outcast, the hurting people of society. You know that he had the power to avoid all that suffering. He could have escaped the ravages of physical torture or of emotional pain. And instead, he chose to take our place. He chose to bear the ultimate humiliation, the ultimate pain, and the sacrifice of the cross. He turned that haunting question around. Rather than asking, why do bad things happen to good people? Now we can rejoice in saying, thank goodness for the good things that have happened to us. Hallelujah for all the blessings God has given us. And my friends, that is the gospel of the garbage dump. That is the good news of God's love that transcends all human suffering. That is the good news of God's grace that transforms us from sinful, struggling creatures into children of faith. We often look around the world and see only the parts and the people who are bad. 
we often condemn and judge with little evidence other than that they are different or that they are struggling even worse than we are. And rather than looking for ways to reach out in Christian witness and faith, we often relegate people, ourselves included, to a life that is barely endured day after day. We discard the chance to realize the lasting healing that builds bridges between nations and countries, that scrapes away the animosity between races and creeds, that increases the understanding between gender and generation, the lasting healing that comes from only one source, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. As he told his disciples on that night of the Last Supper, I am giving everything to make you well and healthy and whole. My body, my blood, my very life. He gathered them out of their individual circumstances, out of their personal garbage dumps, whether fishermen or zealots, whether tax collectors or sinners, whether Floridian or South African. And he brought them together as brothers and sisters around the table of salvation. So may we gather together this day and every day with our brothers and sisters in Christ of every time and every place as we celebrate his grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as you are able and we, as we affirm what we believe through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn of preparation for the Lord's Supper is, I Come With Joy.
please be seated. I hope that as you came in that you received one of our little packets and I will remind you that these can be a little tricky to open, that there is a clear piece on the top that when you peel that back it reveals the wafer and then the purple part you peel back to open the juice. Does everyone have one? Okay. I have one here. My friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Scripture tells us that people will come from north and south, from east and west, to sit around the table in the kingdom with the risen Lord. And so we are invited here because this table belongs to Jesus. It is not the table of First Presbyterian Church. It's not even a Presbyterian table. It is a table that is offered to everyone who accepts and declares that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of their lives. And so in His name, we invite you to come and partake of this feast. Please join me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. O Lord our God, it is hard to believe that you would love us and care for us with such devotion that you would do anything and give everything to bring us back into perfect relationship with you. We know too well that we do not deserve such compassion, yet you offer it to us freely in the gift of Jesus Christ. Where we are sick in body, mind, or spirit, you reach out your healing hand for us to hold. O oh Lord, you lift us up beyond the poor circumstances of life, showing us a better way to live and thrive as your people. Today we pray for our sisters and brothers around the world. We ask for your protection and safekeeping for them in times of trouble, fear, and desperation. We are grateful for the blessings you have given us that make our lives so much easier than the majority of people on earth. Remind us that with such blessings come, comes responsibility to care for others as you care for us. As we gather around your table to join in this joyful feast, may our hearts be opened to embrace all those whom you have created and have called to come to you through the grace of Jesus Christ. Lift us up by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that in the sharing of this bread and cup, we may feel your presence and be united with all who proclaim Jesus as Lord. You have fed us with your word in song and proclamation. Now feed and nourish us and lead us out into the world, to work for your kingdom here on earth, even as we await the fulfillment of your kingdom that is to come. We make this and all our prayers, praying with brothers and sisters in Christ across all times and places, saying the prayer he taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture tells us that on the night in which he was betrayed, that our Lord sat at the table with his disciples, and after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it, 
and he gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which has been shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink you all of it, for as often as you share this cup and this bread, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. First, let us share the bread of life. This is Christ's body, broken for us. Thanks be to God. This is Christ's blood shed for us, the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the thanksgiving after the meal. God is great, God is good, and we thank you for our food. By your hands we all are fed. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. Amen. Some versions in the Bible tell us that after the meal, the disciples got up and sang a hymn as they were going out. So let us do likewise. Please stand as you are able. As we sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you. He's got you right there, pulling you out of that garbage dump and showing you the way to glorious things of glory and honor. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. I probably shouldn't even walk out. <laughs>